morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jamie, your host from Blood... No, it was Blood, Sweat and Metal, but it's the Rocket Diaries now. This is Wednesday, March 3rd, here in Australia, over in the, the America. You're still on what, Tuesday the 2nd. You're approaching midnight, so you'll be the 3rd very shortly. But we have got an awesome show to go through. But before we introduce our wonderful guest, good day, Damien. How you going, man? I'm great, man. Great as usual. It's always a pleasure to come on here and to uh, to meet these band members and find out who they really are behind the music. Yes. And before we do introduce our guest, I've got some breaking news um, that just came out that I need to address. First and foremost, um, the musical pioneer here in Australia that formed Mushroom Records has passed away at the age of 68. His name is Michael Kodinsky. He was the one that revolutionised the Australian music industry. He brought many bands out to the forefront here in Australia. And then also was a touring promoter for Frontiers Touring. He brought a lot of international acts over. And he, this guy was a pioneer in the music industry here in Australia. He passed away at the age of 68, very young, and um, leaves a black, black hole here in Australia music. And um, it's a sad day, so God bless him. He, he was a wonderful man, a wonderful, wonderful man. And if you ever got to meet him, He's a wonderful man, and he's well-loved by his family. So our condolences go out to his family and to his friends as well. Secondly, the mighty band KISS has announced a tour here in Australia. Ticket goes on sale to the general public tomorrow. No, Friday, sorry, here in Australia. The last time you ever get to see KISS, please go and get your tickets. I'll be getting my tickets as well. I'll I'm a massive Kiss fan, as many people know, and I want to give them the farewell that they truly deserve. Even though I did see the farewell tour with the originals back in 2001, but this time with the other members, I'll be seeing them off. Also, this is some awesome news that just came out from Texas and Mississippi. Texas and Mississippi to allow concert venues to reopen at full capacity. And I'll just read just briefly in the first couple of paragraphs. Texas and Mississippi are both lifting the mask mandates and increasing capacities of all businesses and facilities in the state to 100%. This means that social gatherings, including at sports stadiums, concert halls and other live venues, will be allowed in Texas and Mississippi without restrictions. Effectively from March the 10th, all businesses in Texas will be allowed to open at full capacity for the first time in nearly a year. That is great news and we want to see live music and bands and whatnot to go back out and perform in a full max capacity that it should be. And that is wonderful news. So if you've got any touring plans, go to Texas and Mississippi. That's where you're going to get your gig. Anyway, on with the show. We've got this wonderful person. Now, I want us to tell a little story before I introduce this wonderful lady. This person has been listening to the Rocket Diaries, and she's been listening to our interviews, and she loved how we conduct the show and how we manage to have some fun. And that's what we do. Well, before I went on my holiday up to Port Lincoln last week, I received an email from this person wanting to come on our show. And I said to my fiancé, who is the producer of the show, Shereya, I said, yeah, reach out to this person. And so we'll be more than willing to have this person on the show to talk about her band, her music and her life. Well, lo and behold, she comes back and she said, yes, let's set up a date. Let's set up a time. We've got her. She's from the band Upon Wings. She's from Michigan. 
and they're a symphonic metal. They've been around, give or take, since 2010, and they've done some great music as well, some EPs that have been on radio stations in America, and this wonderful person plays bass as well. Her name is Anne Autumn from Michigan. I want to say welcome to the show, Anne, and it's an absolute pleasure having you on. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be on the show. I so appreciate it. And, you know, thank you for all that you guys do for rock and metal music, because it's just great to have a show like this that supports rock and metal music, just kind of the full spectrum. So I know that a lot of bands appreciate it. That's one. That's it's just our pleasure, because the, the main focus on this when I first started was not only do we get the major bands like from record labels on that, but we get also um, mainly focused on the small guys, and that's basically what this show's about. And not only do we just talk about music, because that's what it is, we talk about life in general and just see how they're coping. But more importantly, I want to ask, what interview did you listen to to, re- to send out the email to, to the show? Because it was just, just fascinating just reading your, your email, the first email that you sent that you love the show, you love the interviews. Which, which interview did you listen to at the time? Well, the first one was from a few years ago. It was of Mice and Men, a chat that you guys, that you did with them. But then, ah. um, yeah, so that was like the main one. But I heard the Dave Evans one. That was really <laughs> cool. Yeah, that got yeah. a lot of views, too. I remember it was like it got, you know, it had yeah. a few thousand views. That yes, was a great there one. Are, there are some other episodes that are not on YouTube. They're on Podomatic. I did an interview with Rob Jukes just after he got fired from Exodus. And that is a, that really did blow up. That's still being talked about in um, the web scenes on the, on the internet to this day. That, that was um, the biggest show that we ever done, audience-wise. Um, Dave L. Efferson, yes, that got over 3,000 whatever views it is. Um, the Dave Evans one I just did a couple of weeks ago, that's over 2,200 views. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah, the, the thing about it is, this is where I laugh at the fans that listen to the show. When we get the big name artists on the show or bands, they come out of the wolf works and listen to it but when we get the smaller ones they generally don't care about it. and that's the the funny thing about it there's so many fans out in the world that like to pigeonhole certain bands if they don't like it they won't listen to it but um <laughs> here we just talk about every band that we love in the metal rock genre and uh, upon wings i just want to say before i hand it over to damien you guys should be bigger than what you are, in my opinion. And that, that's a humble opinion. Because when I listen to your music, even though you do sound like Amy Lee, a bit of Within Temptation, a bit of Nightwish, and yes, Amy Lee is from Evanescence. You guys should be huge. Huge. Oh, thank because you. That, that music that you bring out, it just blends in what it is it blends that the whole circle and if you ever did get on a major record label i just can't say why they haven't reached out to you guys i know it's a competition when it comes to the music you know, industries and that but you guys should be pumping a big time in europe because in europe they love this stuff symphonic metal it's like I just uploaded last night my interview with Epica, with Mark Jensen, um, that I recorded last Friday of the new album that's just been released. And they waiting to go back on tour. And I asked Mark a question. Would you ever consider doing a tour with Within Temptation and Nightwish? And they said, yes. They want to do a world tour with Within Temptation and Nightwish. Wow. wow. So, we've got um, to get on that. There would be, we've got to get on that bill. That would be so amazing. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just want to ask, um, did, you guys did start around about 2010? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much, that's when I first had the idea for Upon Wings. And I just started kind of, you know, writing the music and working with a producer to kind of bring the music to life. So that's technically when we started and I started the Facebook page and stuff like that. But we've probably been most active from about 2012 to now, which is so crazy to think it's been almost, yeah, 10 years since we've been like really active. It's so funny how time flies. But yeah, that's about when we got started. Yeah. Well, I'm going to hand the microphone over to you, Damien, because I know you've got some questions and this is an open topic thing. So Damien, ask away, man. I um I I, I want to um not I kind of correct um how you um introduced her um it is Ann Autumn but her uh, last name is Erickson and um uh, I just I really um thank you for reaching out for to us and um and coming on because uh, this is kind of our our baby that um. We've coddled and um, <laughs> grown to love, and uh, thank you for reaching out to us and coming on. And um, I think I think it really is like introspective to all of us, uh, even to to Jamie and I and the band members that we uh, talk to, and um, and that it. It brings to us more of a human feeling uh, rather than just listening to music, but really gaining a perspective for the people that we're talking to. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Now, Anne, I want to ask, when did you first start to get into music yourself? Did you pick it up while when you were little or did that evolve later on in life? Yeah, well... Um, That's a great question. So I started out, like growing up, I listened to musical theater and opera a lot. And that's pretty much all I knew. My parents were never, like they never played rock music. I always hear about people and they say, oh yeah, you know, my dad and my mom's vinyl collection. But my parents like weren't against rock music. They just weren't like into it. They never listened to it. So we just listened to opera and musical theater and I grew up singing all that stuff. And then I was in high school and I heard a rock song for the first time on the radio. And I'll never forget that moment. I was like, what is this? Like, I never heard anything like it. And I was just like, what is this? I love it. I want to hear more of it. And so that's kind of how I got into it. And the first stuff I got into wasn't the heavy metal that, I mean, now I love, you know, heavy metal fears. Later, I got into the Iron Maiden and Judas Priest and all that stuff. But the first stuff I heard was kind of post grunge. So it was like stained and uh, tool, I guess you could kind of say they're not super post grunge, but shine down, see there, you know, bands like that. And um, I don't know, I just totally fell in love with the rock sound. And I wanted to be in a band so badly, but with my voice, I was like, oh, there's no way I can do it because all the bands I heard were the vocals were just rock. I mean, you know, when you hear like a grunge band or a post grunge band or like the female fronted bands at the time, it was just, just totally a raw kind of rock voice. And I have a more opera voice, but then I saw Iron Maiden and I was like, Oh my gosh, he sounds like an opera singer. And he's got this heavy metal backing. And then I discovered more bands like that. And, you know, you mentioned the European scene. I discovered a bunch of European bands they have the more operatic vocal with the metal symphonic backing. And I just fell in love with it. And that kind of inspired me to make my own music with Upon Wings. Mm. Because for me, the late 90s era really wasn't a great time with music for me. Even though there was great bands out there like Hammerfall and Dragon Force and Egg Guy and all that. But mm-hmm. I got into them later. But around the 90s, there was so much difference in music that I used to listen to, like the the golden era, like Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, the names go on. And even Metallica changed. 
their style when they brought out Load and Reload in the mid nineties, and we won't talk about that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, um, but more importantly, when I heard bands like Nightwish and Within Temptation, especially from your background, you come from musical theatre and a pranic type of music. The original lead singer from Night with Taj, she comes from that background too. That's why she can sing that high. And the, the new lead singer from Night with Floor Jensen, she's got that a pranic voice. And my partner, Sharia, she loves Nightwish. And she loves Evanescence. And she loves Within Temptation. She, we heard your, your music over the last two weeks while we were on holiday. And she gets it. It sounds early, um, Evanescent. You sound a bit like Amy Lee. I will say that. And more importantly, you are more of a poet than a songwriter. And that's what makes music so great in the world. They might not be great lyricists, but they'd be great poets. And poets and music do come hand in hand. Well, thank you. Yeah, I... I totally agree. And like when I'm writing lyrics, I do find that it just kind of, you know, comes from my personal life. Um, and I mean, I hope people can relate, but I'm not someone who can sit down and be like, oh, I'm going to write a song about a certain topic. Like I can't just decide, oh, I'm going to do this song on this topic and then write it. It just all stems from like stuff I've been through. And I do kind of keep a journal where I write down you know, lyrics or poetry as life moves on and that sort of thing. And that kind of inspires usually what I write about. Yeah. Now, before I hand it back, before I hand it back over to Damien, were you always a bass player or did you get into bass playing later on? Oh, man, I got in a little bit later on. So I, yeah, I definitely like, you know, as a teenager and stuff and even younger, I did a lot of voice and singing. And then when I got a little older, I was like, oh, I want an instrument to go with this, especially when I got into rock music. So I tried guitar and it just didn't work for me. I don't know. I muted the strings no matter what I did. I was just like, I don't like this. This isn't working. And I, I never really, I tried drums a few times, but I never really considered doing drums for some reason. Or I tried bass and I just loved it. And I play with my fingers, but there's something about the bass that I just instantly loved and so that was something i picked up later but yeah yes. all right damien over to you man um i was gonna uh i was gonna say like i think the for me the best music comes from those pieces of your life that you put into a song and you you tell um, for me personally literally i think those those things that uh, you have experienced in life bring out the best in music, and uh, and that they really uh, tell a story of, about the person that's that's either um, written them or is singing them, and it's just it's more it, it's more fulfilling music as far as I'm concerned. You know what I mean? I don't. I don't know what everybody else thinks, uh, but but um, for me, because I I play music too, so it's like um, it's like that that goes into the heart of the person that's singing, and and it it really just it tells about them, and and we have a more understanding of of who they are as a person and what they've gone through, and. And many of us can relate to a lot of those things. So I think it, I think it brings a lot to the music scene. Yeah, I agree. I mean, now that you mention it, I almost feel like some people have heard a Pound Wings music might know a little bit more about me than even some friends of mine, you know, who haven't heard it just because of kind of what you mentioned. Like, I might not on a regular basis kind of verbalized stuff I've been through but if you listen to upon wing songs like you can you know kind of tell you really have a lot of really good music too I just have to say that it sounds great thank you well put together it's melodic it it um 
it touches your soul. And I think I think that's I think that's what I like about it so much is that it's it's just it's very um, it makes you feel like like a, a one on one relationship with with your music because it it brings something to you that uh, to the average listener. You know what I mean? So I'm, I just I appreciate your music. I think it's beautiful. Thank you so much. I so appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Stop flirting, Damien. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, no. It's all good. Uh, Damien and I have been talking for over six years, and this is the... We've got like a brother relationship, even though we have our disagreements, but we're, we're more like brothers, even though we live in separate countries and whatnot, but one day I'll get to America and have a barbecue with him. But um, That's right. And, and I want to ask... Um, how did you make up with Brett Hestia from Creed? And I know he played special guests on your songs like Afterlife and whatnot, but Brett, he just brings a different flavor and a different feel into the dynamic of Upon Wings. Yeah. Um, well, you know, one of the first bands I got into was actually Creed. And I know that, like, sometimes people these days are like, oh, Creed. But, hey, I stand by Creed. I think that My Own Prison is a great rock record. Creed and is an awesome band. They did a lot of really good music. They totally are. They are great. I mean, I'm surprised that we don't hear their music more, you know, on the radio, on, like, the classic, you know, rock or whatever. Um, Because I just think that they have great songs. And they have millions of fans out there. If they ever did a reunion, you know, all those people would come see them. So I would be one of them too. But um, I knew that Brett did a lot of production and I remember seeing him with Creed. He was their bass player. Probably it was towards the end of when Creed was out there on tour, maybe on their third record. And I just, I've always been a fan of his work, not just in Creed, but in his other bands as well. And so, you know, I've listened to his production. I just really liked it. And I got in touch with like his manager and I sent them our music and that sort of thing. And we worked it out that he was, you know, willing to produce a, a single for Upon Wings. And we did it in Chicago. It was a studio that unfortunately is no longer there. Last I heard Groove Master Studios and Johnny K owned that studio. So he's like a big name in rock. And we went there and recorded Afterlife, and he sang guest vocals on it as well. Um, and I just think he did such a great job with it. He's a really great producer, and he helped me a lot, you know. In this and when go back five years ago, um, when you recorded the song "You Are My Weapon," how did that song came about, and what was the message behind that for the fans who haven't listened to that song? So with You Are My Weapon, I um I wanted to do a heavier song because I love heavy music and I love heavy guitars and that sort of thing. Thematically, I wasn't quite sure where to go with uh, what I was going to do with it. But just what I was going through at the time, I was still dealing with some of the stuff that, you know, I was dealing with when writing Afterlife. Both of them kind of have a similar theme. They're about losing a loved one. But with You Are My Weapon, it's more about that person in your life who's your anchor and who is your weapon in life and losing that person. And then having though the belief that even though they're not on earth anymore, that you'll see them again, but also that they're there, you know, in heaven, like looking down on you, guiding you, protecting you, that sort of thing. So that's kind of the theme behind your right weapon. And yeah. the track was mixed. Actually, the single was mixed by Corey Lowry who's in seven dust right now. And he did a real great job. And then Kevin Jardine of slaves on dope has a really cool guitar solo in there. So. Yeah. And it, just looking at the visuals on the video shoot, it just well done. Um, how long did that production of the video shoot took? Because it looks like you were in multiple places at some places. Yeah, that took forever. Oh my gosh. I, I want to say, you know, maybe a month for not just shooting, but editing and that sort of thing. And yeah, yeah that mountain thing that we're at is actually 
not far from where I live. Um, but it looked real. I thought it looked cool on the video. It looked like I was like in mountains, you know, somewhere. <laughs> and so I was really happy that I found that kind of mountain esque yeah. thing. It just goes to show that when I'm, when we get people like you and and bands like yourself that reach out to us, it's just refreshing that um. It is really, really refreshing that we can just sit here, relax, and just talk about it. Because um, one thing that is different for us compared to the other radio podcast, whatever, we are not scripted. We're more organic, and we just go off the cuff. Um, all the questions are just free flowing. Like it just. This is just what I love about you, Annie, because you come from a background of musical um, theatre and you weren't into, well, your family didn't listen to the heavier stuff, but you got brought into that realm and you started to become a musician yourself and you wanted to be in a band and your lyrics and your poetry and all that all blend into, into the main ingredients and the persona that you are right now. I want to ask, why didn't a major record label come along and pull, pull you under their wings? Because I said previously before we started recording, I truly believe you guys should be huge than what you already are. And I'm saying that humbly. I'm not saying to um to put you off guard here because... This music that you created, it's so popular in Europe. And with, with um, people saying and mainly making quotes about Upon Wings that the music sounds like Evanescence Within Temptation Nightwish and all that great accolade that you guys have been mentioned in magazines and on radio. But I want to ask, Specifically, have any major record labels ever reached out to you? And if so, how did that fall apart? Because I truly believe you should be blowing the charts right now. I really, truly really believe that. Oh, thank you. I so appreciate that. You know, we've never really, I don't know, I've never really tried, I guess. I mean, I'm, you know, I love making the music and releasing the music and that sort of thing. I, I've never really barked up that tree. I mean, it would be amazing for a big label to pick us up. And we've actually had, it's, it just takes such skill and talent to play metal music. It's true. It's true. And like, I remember back 10 years ago, as soon as you brought up symphonic metal, they go, oh, what's that? I said, it's metal with a little bit of a pranic vocals in it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, um, like, when my fiancé introduced me to Nightwish and I listened to Taj, um, I didn't really like it that much. But as it grew on me, I'm starting to like it. I like Floyd Jensen more than Taj now because um, Floyd Jensen, she can hit those aprantic notes like you never believe. And... I met Floor a few times when she came to to Australia with Nightwish, and um, just hearing her hitting that note, and I, I have seen her struggle sometimes on stage here in Australia when she's when she's um performing. That's because when they do come to Australia, it is so damn hot outside, and when they come inside, it's still got the heat from the temperature summer here that halfway through the show, she's got to walk off the stage to get her breath back because she's hitting those aprantic notes like you never believe. And wow, it's, just yeah. phenomenal. it's just phenomenal. But what was it like performing um, for you? Like you, you would create a, a EP and you've been getting some airplay on the radio stations in your neck of the woods. What was it like for you hearing the audience singing the song back at you when you're performing live. Oh, man, I can only imagine. I mean, the thing with the Pond Wings is that 
we've released music along the way and I've performed, you know, live throughout my life and everything. But Upon Wings actually like as a band hasn't really played like a formal show because we're located all over the place. We have people in Canada and, you know, all over the place. But I yeah. can tell you that hearing my song on the radio, I will never forget that. That's one of the best, I don't know, one of the best feelings I think I've ever had in my life. You always hear about artists talk about the first time they heard it on the radio, but I remember jumping in a friend's car because they had XM radio and I didn't. And then to hear them intro the song and hear it come on, I don't know. It just, it felt like, it just felt like the best thing in the world that could have ever happened. (laughs) Well, you must have been pinching yourself when you heard your single on the radio the first time. Oh, yeah, I I definitely was. It was, it was wonderful. Yeah. Now, um, this is a, a little bit of a different question. Um, when you look at music as yourself, do you see a different change in the music business compared to what it was back in the heyday, like of the 80s? Because I certainly do. Um, I know technology now has transpired in a certain way where it makes it, easier for people to access music whether it's on youtube or spotify but when you look at the music as a whole do you see a huge difference now compared to what it was yeah that's a great question i definitely think so i mean i um i wasn't making music until about 10 years ago and even in that time period things have changed but when i started to really get into music it was more in the late 90s, early 2000s. And I think the big difference, though, when it comes to music creation, obviously, is that when you look back in the 80s and 90s or whatnot, you really had to have such a huge budget to make a song, you know, and make an album. The technology just wasn't there. Mm. Now, thankfully, one of the benefits of how the music industry has changed is that, you know, I can... I can afford to make music like musicians like me or, you know, like a lot of people out there can afford to make their own music because the technology is there and then we can release it ourselves. We can get it out there on Apple and on Spotify and tell people to listen. Whereas back in the day, there were these gatekeepers where, you know, not only was it super expensive to record your own stuff, but there was like no way to release it. Right. Because you had vinyl or CDs even, and, there was no other way to really get it out there other than a major label, like paying all this money to do it. So I feel like there are some benefits, but it's definitely hard to make a living doing music today versus back then. So that's obviously like a big negative to it. And especially with touring being gone, merchandise obviously is a big part of how bands can make a living now, or just even make up the cost of what it is to record music and, whenever someone buys a Pine Wings merch, like it definitely helps the band. I'm always really appreciative. I remember a lot of independent bands when they first started. They started on MySpace before they went on a Facebook. Oh, yeah, I had a MySpace. I loved MySpace. I miss it. (laughs) And um, that's how I got onto Facebook, actually, was through MySpace. But there was a lot of bands on MySpace that created their music and posts it up on MySpace, and they were getting their viewership not from YouTube or Spotify wasn't even around then. They were getting their fan base, building their fan base solely on MySpace. And I've seen so many of these um, smaller bands have become phenomenal bands due to MySpace. They, they've been opening up for bands, international bands, and doing tours all around the place, all off the back of MySpace. Like, if we go back into the um, the pre-internet era, most bands still didn't get played on the radio because more people were doing it. If you want to hear a certain band and get recognised from, from a certain band, it was more of a word of mouth. Like you're down at the local bar having a drink and said, hey, man, check this band out. They're awesome. You say, yeah, I'll check it out. And then somewhere along the line, you meet him again. 
and they were asking, hey, man, did you check that, that song in? Yeah, I can't wait for the album to come out, man. And then on the Thursday when the new releases come out, everyone was lining up at the record store buying the new album. That's how I see it in music. Yeah. That's how I see it. And, yes, there's not many record stores open still, but there are some. And we've got one massive one here in Australia called Utopia Records in Sydney. And um, I want I want them to get some of your albums here to Australia, if you can. So that oh, I would love that. I should send them uh, some. But um, the, next, the question I want to ask here, what do you do um, now in your personal life since music I know that you can't perform um, that much now, and that's for other reasons, but what do you do besides music in your personal life? What keeps you busy? Wow, let's see. Well, music is definitely a big part of my life. Um, for my day job, I do I do writing, and I also do radio here in the States. So all of my jobs kind of tie into music, which I love. Um, and then, I don't know, what else do I do for fun? Lately, I didn't do anything because we're all on lockdown all the time. <laughs> well, so Damon, I, yeah. I think Anne needs to get us on her radio show, don't you think? I mean, hey. Yeah, we that'd need, be good. That'd I would be love awesome. that. That would be awesome. We, I would we need that. more boys. We need more boys. Tell people how to uh, get merch from... Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, merch. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, so our merchandise is available through, well, just go to upenwings.com and there will be a link to merchandise on there. And we're going to be getting some new stuff in. So we've got like skull caps and we have some CDs from our previous EP, physical CDs and autographed pictures. Skull cap, and stuff like that. not a shirt. Now, and, um, I believe, now correct me if I'm wrong before I hand it back over to Damon. You're in process of writing new material, is that correct? Or new EPs about to be released? Yes, yes. And that's been one thing about the past year, you know, not being able to go out there and do much. At least I've been able to work on some new music. And we've got a new single that I'm hoping to solidify real soon to get out, hopefully in about a month. So I'll definitely send it to you guys when it's out and you guys can, you know, listen, rock it out and everything. But um, and then hopefully the EP a few months later. But what I'm excited about is that the new music is heavier. And because lately we've been doing some holiday songs, which I really love doing because I'm cheesy. I love the holidays and stuff like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was honored that you guys liked Oh Holy Night because I was real happy with how that turned out. So I'm happy you guys, you know, like that. That song turned out fantastic. It sounded great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, obviously the Christmas music and stuff. But this time we kind of went the opposite end of the spectrum, and it's heavier with really heavy guitars and cool, like, guitar soloing. Because I love the guitar solo. I think it's just such a great part of any, you know, like, metal or hard rock song. So just head to, if people want to... um kind of keep up with the new music and stuff you can go to upenwings.com and follow us and if you can follow us on spotify and apple music like that's a big help and then when we have new stuff that comes out it'll be i'm pretty sure automatically it'll be like put on your playlist and everything like that yeah and that's what um is great about speaking to you and is that um this is like i said before i'm going to say it again this is just so refreshing that you reached out to us via email because you listened to a lot of the interviews that's been on our show. And now we're talking. And Hey, you're a fan of the show, and we're actually interviewing you, and you're in a band. How awesome is this? You're a fan of the show. <laughs> and um, I'm just pinching myself because I remember my very first um, episode I did. Um, on the it, was, it used to be called Blood, Sweat and Metal and I remember someone from Peru who doesn't speak English but they listened to the show from start to finish and sent me an email saying that was an awesome interview I need to find out who that Australian band is and I'm saying wow, 
I'm reaching places that I never thought in my wildest dreams, Peru and Ecuador, writing back to me. And it was in English. They wrote back to me in English, but they don't speak English fluently. And I'm just pinching myself. Like, when I get these emails now and again, it's, it's refreshing. It's really, really refreshing. And I'm humbled. I'm, I'm not saying, hey, look at me, look at me. When I get these emails from um, people, including yourself, it really does touch my heart that we are getting, because um, there's a lot of, I will say this, there's a lot of bloody hard work behind the scenes that put the shows together. I mean, there's so many terabytes of hardware that is stored for the years I've been doing. But more importantly, what I'm trying to get at is it shows that the um, the work that we put into it, it is getting recognised and we are getting the credit and we are getting, like, we're not getting paid to do this. I don't expect to get a sense for this. But more importantly, when we start to get the acknowledgement of the work that we do and people like yourself and the right to us and say, you know, awesome interviews and watch this show, it really touched our heart and we want to say thank you wholeheartedly. Oh, well, thank you. I'm so glad to hear that. And, you know, like I mentioned earlier, thank you for really championing hard rock and heavy metal music. It's great to have outlets like yours who do these interviews and help get the music out there. And yeah. music is so universal. And I think that, you know, people all over the world love this kind of heavy music. And so I'm not surprised that, you know, people from all over the world tune into your show. It's something that really brings everyone together, which is nice because everything's so divided now it always seems it's nice to have something like music that really just brings everyone together yeah and like i said it is a bit of a constant battle where yeah okay we get the big name artists on our show from bands like megadeth like dave else and not and the numbers will go up but when we get the smaller ones that generally don't want to listen to it now it's a hard pill to swallow and yet I even have arguments with myself, not with anyone. Why isn't people tuning in? Why haven't we got more subscribers? Okay, one, we don't have a website at the moment. I've been building a website for the last five years, but I'm not computer savvy when it comes to developing websites. When it comes to audio stuff like this and that, yeah, give me the buttons so I know how to work it, but I need someone to create a website. If I can create a website, yeah, maybe we can get... Um, more subscribers but here's the thing when I see other people picking up my interviews like the blub and mouth or of all people which they have I get views from from their posts on the show but they don't want to cross over and make the commitment to subscribe to the channel which is a bit of a rock and a hard place you watch a show it costs you nothing to watch it why don't you just commit yourself and if you want to keep continue to watch the show, subscribe. I don't, right. I, I, don't <laughs> understand, I don't understand it. But I get it. People want to be caught up with all the other things that's around them. I don't. I don't want to be caught up in it. I want to be, like, before I hand it back over to Damien, the reason I started this was I remember when I was the age of 9 and 10, and now in my childhood, we had domestic violence. And I was a child husband. I was protecting my mother from all the beatings that she was getting for that alcoholic father. And the only two things that helped me was music and sport. But when I was in my room, I had a double cassette player. And I was listening to the radio. I was taping the songs off the radio, but I was recording my own voice over the top in between the, the songs. Now, I said to myself, if I ever want to get into radio or podcasting as a full-time thing, how am I going to be different than all the disc jockeys that I listen to? Like, I've heard millions of interviews that people have conducted. I said to myself, I need to be different because I don't want to be the same person like these disc jockeys asking the same question over and over and over and over again. 
I want it to be organic. I want it to be different than everyone else. When I had Vinnie Paul on before he passed away, he was playing with um, Hell Yeah, and they were coming to Australia on a tour. I said to Vinnie Paul, I've got one Pantera question for you. And no, it's not about the reunion, because I know every time they ask you, uh, when, when you come on an interview, uh, Vinny, they always ask you if it's going to be a Pantera reunion, blah, blah, blah. I said, that's not what I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask, is there ever a possibility that you're going to re-release the four albums before Cowboys of Hell? He got stumped. He goes, wow, I didn't expect that question. That's a thing. When I created this whole um, program, I want it to be organic. I want to ask questions that they've never been asked before. And more importantly, I want to go a little bit deeper with Damien's help to get into their life a little bit because it's called the Rocker Diaries now. Yeah, I love the name, the Rocker Diaries. I think that it definitely, you know, tells what the show is about. It was blood, sweat, and metal. <laughs> it was. That's cool, too. That's a cool one, too. Yeah. But I was getting all the copyright strikes from YouTube because we're playing the same song of the blood, sweat, and metal with the Machine Head um, single, Blood, Sweat, and Beers from Machine Head. And I was getting flagged by um, YouTube, and they were censoring me from Japan, Iraq. And I'm saying, I don't... I don't mind um, Iraq and all of that because they probably don't listen to it. But Japan, come on. Japan's one of the biggest music um, markets in the world. You've got Europe, you've got Europe, um, UK, you've got America, and you've got Japan. That's one of the biggest music markets in the world. But anyway, Damien, I'll hand it over to you, man. Do that. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. The floor is yours. Iraq. Yes. Iraq listens to metal music, although metal music is outlawed in Iraq. And we even spoke to Marwan from across the Qatar, and they're the only metal band to ever come out of Iraq. And wow. and it, and it it was fantastic. They have great music. They uh, they covered a lot of Metallica songs when they were there and whatnot. And um, like like we talked about Metallica earlier, um, like they just they have really symphonic music. A lot of it is orchestrated. Um, they had they had backup from an orchestra in one of their their songs, and it it was just really fantastic music. Um, and I I I do have a question for you, Anne, and it concerns um, it concerns your song that. I think you released it in 2020. Um, I think I'm not sure, um, but uh, but your song singled out, and um, that was really that was really deep. And I I kind of want to get your perspective on what brought about your um, your thoughts for that for doing that song. Singled out. Do you mean the Amazing Grace song that we did? Like the cover yeah, song? Yeah. No, it was singled out. It was called singled out. Okay, because I don't. We didn't release a song called singled out. I don't know if there's another band out there that did. Um, um we were I in thought, a singled out column. Oh yes, okay. Is that maybe what it is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, we were in a singled out column, and it was for um, a version of Amazing Grace. Yeah, it was over the holiday. It was over the holiday period, I think. Yeah, yeah. It was. It was in. Oh, it was in uh, May of 2020. May of. Yeah, I think May. Well, um, I think it was in March or April. I think it was April, maybe when we did that one. But if you mean, yeah, because we never released a song called "Singled Out," but we were in a column called "Singled oh, Out" yeah. for our "Amazing Grace" song, which came out that, last year. That's what it was. Okay, okay, cool. That's what I thought. Because when you said singled out, I was like, it must be that column. Um, but yeah, and that probably did run around May. The song came out in April of last year. 
And it was, well, we decided because everything shut down with the coronavirus and it was just like a weird time. I mean, no one, I mean, who could have imagined that suddenly everyone would be forced to be at home. No one could hug each other, see each other, that sort of thing. It was such a weird time. And, and it kept... the... oh, sorry, I'm not supposed yeah. to talk about that. No, no, go ahead. No, we're not supposed to talk about that. We were warned by other producers and things that we weren't supposed to talk about that. Oh, okay. About? About the oh. whole pandemic thing. Okay. Okay. No, 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 no. Just go. Just go on. Yeah. No, no. It's just, yeah. Just no, like, it's just, um, yeah. So we put out, yeah, we basically, like, put out um, a version of Amazing Grace because they kept hearing it all over the news and stuff like that. It was just kind of a song that was giving people inspiration during a difficult time. And we recorded that with Corey Lowry from Cedar, who is super talented, just like Cedar. he's an amazing guitarist, amazing writer, performer, just everything. You and, just so yeah. many bands here. Like, and I love Chevelle and Cedar and, and Creed and just all these great bands that have come out. Yeah, I love it, too. I mean, that's the first stuff I ever got into. So that kind of inspired us to do our own version of Amazing Grace. And there's a music video on our YouTube that you can check out. It's uh, youtube.com slash upon wings official. And yeah, it was just hopefully, you know, giving people something that song seemed to give people hope. So it was just like our own take on that traditional song. Yeah, um, and what Dame was trying to say earlier about the pandemic, I'll, I'll, I'll just say this. Um, I, I've been getting messages from record labels because, as you know, I get interviewed from major labels to get on that show. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dame and I have a different perspective and different feelings to certain things when it comes to the pandemic. And on this show, I've been asked by the record labels not to, to mention the pandemic because it gets it gets a bit murky and a slippery slope in certain people because there's certain bands out there they've got to go through and abide by what they get told by the management i get that but when it comes to other things like for myself i mean i can't see my family due to a border being shut. I'm not talking about um, mask mandate or vaccination. That, that's not what I'm going to. I'm not even going to touch that. Right? But mm -hmm. when I can't see my family in a different state in the same country as where I live, I have a problem with it. All right? We've got these, lead we've got these leaders here in Australia that uh, trying to be above the law and making it harder for people to get reunited with their family for whatever reason, wedding, funeral, you name it. There are certain leaders here in Australia are stopping people from entering their state to see their family. I have a problem with that, and I haven't seen my family for two years. Wow. Now, now when I get all these... Um, messages from record labels said we can't talk about the pandemic. I get it, but it's hard because Damien and I, we had a, a heated conversation about it. And I said, Damien, we've got our own opinions about it. I get it. But when it comes to the working field, there's certain things that we just can't bring up because if they go, if let's say, for instance, Texas and Mississippi are reopening up their venues now to a full capacity without any mask mandate, right? In our, in our perspective, in Damien and my perspective, we don't think it's necessary to wear masks at all. If you're protected, why should the other person wear a mask? But I'm not going down that rabbit hole. I am not going down it because it opens up a can of worms. What you mean, already said. It, op it opened up a can of worms and it's opened up for a debate. I get shut down. I try to tell Damien why we can't talk about it for this reason because there's so much confusion. Like I totally get it. 
the world is at odds right now about this. And uh, some some countries are on lockdown still. So you're yeah. still on lockdown. And America is not on lockdown. And that's that's the whole disperspective of everything is that the all these countries have different rules and regulations and everything. And it's absolutely. And some people are just forced to to go by that. But when it comes to music, I would just want people to bring out great music. I want them to get paid. I mean, without touring, how are bands are supporting themselves? If you've got if you've got a fan base or a record label behind you, that's the only way that you're going to get the the money income to flow through. Other than that, without touring, it takes the whole budget out of your pay packet. Yeah, I mean, I think that when touring comes back, it's obviously going to help a lot because bands these days, you know, as you know, we make our money off touring. The smaller bands, maybe not so much, but touring is a big part of it. But that's why, yeah, I mentioned merch. Like, it helps so much when people buy merch right now. And when people buy our music and hopefully when we release this new music in a month or so, it'll help a lot. You know, if people support the band by doing that, I always say to people when they ask, like, how can I support my favorite band right now? The best way is, you know, merch and just listen to their music, stream the music and go follow them on social media, follow them online. Yeah. Well, just, I'm, I'm getting off topic of the pandemic now. I'm, I'm going back onto music. When was the last time that you performed live before the shutdown and the lockdown? Well, Pun Wings, like I mentioned, we've never really like performed live as a band or anything, which is yeah. so weird to think, but it's because we're all, you know, all over the place. And definitely when things open up again, I'm hoping yeah. maybe towards the end of the year, we can book something probably around the Detroit area, which is, you know, kind of where we're based and everything. There are a lot of great venues there and acts come through all the time. So I'm hoping for that, but. I've always performed just throughout life, doing random things. I mean, even singing at a friend's wedding, you know, stuff like that. So, but it'll yeah, be like uh, really cool to actualize some of these songs live. Because you, in Detroit, you've got so many iconic venues there. You had Cobo Hall there, which is no oh, longer there. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Auburn Hall, Auburn Falls, whatever it is. Um, that's another place there. You, you've got, um, oh, what was that? Tiger Stadium that used to be there. Oh, yeah. yeah. I know. I love our venues. Um, we just lost a big one that I'm not sure if you've heard of it, the Palace of Auburn Hills. Maybe. Yeah, yeah I'm sure that oh, one of you guys. It. That was a great venue, but they, um, they moved it. Now we have Little Caesars Arena in downtown, which is a beautiful venue. But the palace, I mean, I grew up going there, and the, there's just something about going to a familiar place for so many years. It's so sad to see it go. So what was is, the first? Is the, what was the, is what was the first? The, the, oh, go, okay, Jamie. Go, Jamie. You want to ask something? <laughs> yeah, is the is the palace like a more intimate view uh, venue? Because the where I live, I live in Charleston, South Carolina, so we have the. Um, we have the Charleston Music Hall, which is like a very, uh, it's, a, it's a very intimate setting. There's like 15 rows on the bottom tier and like another like four rows on the top tier. But you can see and hear everything from everywhere that you are. It's just, it's just so small and so, so close together. Like you have a front row seat no matter where you're sitting. Wow, that sounds awesome. That's probably more like in Detroit, um, St. Andrews Hall is a smaller venue and it's owned by Live Nation, but it's it's probably the smallest like club venue that we have. I'm not sure how many it seats, but probably around a thousand. The Palace was huge. It was our big arena. I mean, that's where U2 or the Rolling Stones, those huge bands would come through as an indoor arena and the Pistons would play there as well and it was in Auburn Hills so it was outside of Detroit in a suburb and yeah so it was like our big indoor venue that all the big acts would come through and it wasn't the summertime which yeah, yeah. the other one that you got got is oh, something rapids something rapids Grand Rapids yeah Grand, Grand Rapids 
Yeah, Grand Rapids. Yeah, so that's um, that's on the other side of where I live. I kind of live in between Detroit and Grand Rapids. They've got the Van Andel Arena, which is cool. I've seen, let's see, I saw Poison and Def Leppard there a few years ago, which was so cool. I love Def Leppard. Oh, my gosh. I don't want watch Def Leppard when I was 15. Wow. My That's dream, cool. And my dream, or my one of my bucket lists is trying to get Rick Allen on the show because I love Rick Allen. No, oh, yeah, that I can. That'll definitely happen. Just hang in there. Yeah, I mean he's great. I just I love Def Leppard. But yeah, they've got Van Andel and they've got some smaller venues out there too. It's a smaller city than Detroit, but it's a nice, it's a beautiful city too, and I have a lot of family out there. I think I think Rick Allen now lives in the U.S. Now I'm pretty certain. Wow, huh? I'm pretty certain he lives in the U.S. Now I'm I'm pretty certain he does now, and he's a painter now. Um, Rick Allen wants to do a mural of the late um, Eddie Van Halen. Um, I reckon that yes. would be awesome, and um, whatnot. But yeah, um, Def Leppard. What was the first? gig that you actually saw and as a child or as a young teenager well as a little kid i think some of the first ones that i don't know if it really counts when you're just a little kid but i remember seeing so give some retrospect to people what age are you right now yeah Oh gosh, no, I can't. <laughs> Always keep that. See, I'm a, I'm a woman. I'm a girl. Uh, so I'm never. <laughs> are, are you in your? You, you're probably in your 30s, I would guess. Oh, I can't tell. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Hasn't your mom told you that you can't ask a woman her age? <laughs> but I would say I'm, I'm not old, but I'm not young. That's how I see it. <laughs> okay. okay, I get it. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> but but um, when, as a little kid. I was probably five or six when I went to my first show, and I think it was the Monkees and the New Kids on the Black, something silly like that. Oh, but that, definitely. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was into the Monkees when I was a kid. It was weird. They would rerun those TV shows, and they were like old TV shows, but as a kid, you get fixated on stuff, and I loved the Monkees, and I still like their music. So. Awesome. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here we go, guys. All together now. When I saw her face, when I was a believer. <laughs> I love that song. Oh, my gosh. Um, but, yeah, and then when I was older, my first show was was a really random one because, and I still, I like this band. They're maybe my guilty pleasure band, but it was Goo Goo Dolls with Sugar yep. Ray and Fastball. <laughs> and, I mean, I think they write great music. It wasn't a heavy show, obviously, but it kind of was because they're heavier. At least at this time, they were a little bit heavier live, it seemed. But it was just, a, it was so amazing. I remember I'd never been at any concert like that. And my friend, you know, had me go to the front with her and we we're like sandwiched against the the wall there in the front, like up against the stage. And we we're just like, ah, it was so much fun. And so I just fell in love with music and live music at that point. Others. This is this this been an awesome show. I know we had a bit of technical glitch there. I've been dropping in and out, but we're back in and now. Gone over an hour and a half. We might have another half hour. You, you want to stay around for half an hour more? Oh, I mean, I'll stay on. You know, I'll stay on as long as you want. If you have more questions. Oh, you Wait. are awesome. We love you already. Aw, yeah. I love you guys. Well, one of my um. Well, my very first concert was Kiss. I'm a massive, massive Kiss fan. Wow. And um, I saw them without makeup. It took them 15 years to come back to Australia after 1980. Um, they came back in 95 without the makeup. And that was the first one. And Death Blafford, uh, Alex Cooper, ACDC. The list goes on and on and on. I have but to say, Kiss, what, being a, that's amazing. That is really cool that Kiss was your first. Yeah. Um, but more importantly, my last concert before this lockdown happened was Alex Cooper last year. Wow. And uh, it's just um, amazing now that I look back over the last 12 months and saying we had the bushfires here in Australia just before that. We lost so many 
over a billion now of wildlife animals. We had bushfires galore. As a matter of fact, I've got a, um, a memory notification on my Facebook that yesterday was the day a year ago that the bushfires stopped burning in New South Wales. Oh, wow. Yesterday was the, was the, was the last day that the bushfires stopped. And then I went to um, went to Alex Cooper on the third. I went on went to Alex Cooper on the thirteenth of February last year. We still had the bushfires raging. Like I said, yesterday was the last stage of the bushfires. But um, funny enough, that's when around about now last year. That's when everything went into lockdown here in Australia, and I haven't been to a gig since. Because, um, funny enough, before I went on my holiday last week, we had, I know a band here in Adelaide, they're a metal band called Chris Corroded, and they were going to start up a, um, a metal festival, like a little small festival called um, Metal SA. And you have all these um, bands from South Australia playing. They had to cancel it due to the restrictions. Well, funny enough, Two days later, while I was up on my holiday, they re- they lifted the restrictions on how many people can be at the venue. And also, you can now dance on the dance floor. You don't have to sit down and watch the band anymore here in South Australia. And I'm saying, oh my goodness, wouldn't my friend be fit and chipped? <coughs> Two days prior to that, you had to cancel the, the festival. Now... He's lost all the money. He's lost mm. all all the revenue. He can't rebook the show till next year. And now we've got the we've got gigs coming now. You've got all these gigs that you can dance on the dance floor. You've got a little bit more people at the venue. I'm like, oh, my friend will be fit and chips right now because he lost money. Wow, that's crazy. I think the last big show that I went to before everything happened was Tool with their Fear Inaculum tour and I love Tool. I don't know if you guys like Tool, but that was a great show. I've seen them I think three well, times what? at this point. Tour with- yeah. That is so awesome. Tool is like absolutely one of my favorite bands of all time. So um that would that would be amazing. I I can't even imagine what it was like to do that. Yeah, I mean, they were, it was such a great show. It was at an arena in downtown Detroit. And yeah, I've seen them three times. I think the first time was on their, gosh, what was that album? The 10,000 Days album? Am I saying that right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it was, it was like doing promo for that album. That was my first time seeing them. And then I saw them, let's see, well, they didn't tour forever, as you know. And then they came back to Detroit and I got to see them in an outdoor venue. And then it was about a year and a half later when they came again. I yeah. love that record too, that Fear Inoculum. I really think that was one of the best records of the entire, you know, decade. Yeah. You get the last album, the last album that recorded of Tool? Yes. Yeah. I know there was a little bit of a, um, a debate that they only did the certain amount of copies at the start of that album. And I don't know if you, if you saw it, they had this limited edition um, purchase where it looked like a, um, was it a TV or something like that? You paid over $100 or whatever it was, but it, it opens up and it, it looks like a TV. Huh. Yeah, I just, yeah, I yeah, mean, that was, that was, yeah, I wasn't aware of it. Album. Yeah, it was. It was just you, you open it up, it was like a little TV or something. That's like that. cool. Yeah. I love Maynard. I think he's such a genius. That's that's my actual that's actually my last name, Maynard. So, no way! Oh my gosh! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's and, so uh, cool. I've always said this about two. Why don't they just do one song and don't because <laughs> all their songs are long anyway. They're right. over like nine, ten, ten minutes long. Why don't they just make one song and just be done with it? Right. That's a good point. (laughs) Yeah. 
Because, because, okay, it took a very, look, it took years. It took almost, it, it took almost, what, six years, ten years for Tool to release a new album. And the thing is about Tool is that they're very introspective. They, uh, Maynard uh, has uh, studied Carl Jung, who was a great psychologist. And I've studied psychology for probably 25 years of my life. And Maynard, or, uh, Carl Jung is like one of the most prolific psychologists of all time who actually had experiences with uh, LSD and stuff like that. And, and he gained introspective from that. And he gained, a, he gained a knowledge of the human condition from that. And I think that's what uh, what most brought me to uh, love Tool is that that they they brought some of that to their music and especially with like 46 and two because they they uh, wandered on what it would be like if we were at a higher level and human beings could actually. Um, condition themselves to be on that level with other human beings which is where i'm at at this point in my life and so i i have a lot of intelligent talk with uh people that i speak with during the day and and it's and it's it, it is a really awesome feeling to be able to do that mm -hmm. i'll say even the last album the last album was a bit more psychedelic compared to the heavier stuff that they used to do. Um, I, I did find that out. Um, listen to listen back at that album, the last album that was recorded, it was more psychedelic rather than the heavier stuff, really. And that 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 go to bounce like Opeth too. They went heavy and then they went more psychedelic. I'm I'm hearing that they they want to go back to the heavier stuff. I say I don't think Opeth would really go full heavy again they will go heavy but to go full 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 heavy i don't think they will but that hey music changes i just want Anne to keep being heavy like when she first That's started good. it's good it's good that music started, means. <laughs> well and, and you said it yourself um the the last couple of singles that you um done had brought out the heaviest side you're getting heavy and heavy and heavier yeah i um no i'm excited because <laughs> i think it's kind of a, a dichotomy like you think of like an opera voice or that sort of thing as being a more um you know intimate song or more non-heavy song beautiful song or whatnot and i like doing some of that stuff but i think it's so cool to have that kind of more delicate voice i don't know if i'd say delicate but the more like operatic feminine voice amid like a really like violent you know <laughs> guitar driven backing i think yeah. it sounds really cool it i sounds... want to i really 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 i've been biting my tongue to ask this question i'm gonna ask it on the show i want Anne to do a project for our show i wish she can do a theme song for our show damien what do you reckon oh that'd be awesome <laughs> that would be awesome oh my gosh <laughs> Awesome. There you go. I'll see what I can do. Wow. <laughs> that would, that would be so cool. There you go. That's a project. And, um, like, we don't really have a theme song at the moment, but I reckon you, you can pull it off very well. I I'll see what I can. can do. All right. So, um, that what? Would, oh, I, that would, I don't even know what to say to that. That's like, if, what? <laughs> what oh, we, we have on our on our like intro <laughs> what that, that was insane but and like i said it's been an absolute pleasure i wish we can come on radio with you um so you can interview us or whatever yeah. i mean i'll yeah. like I'm oh. please because they played because because they sang that song is are we going to get a strike every time we do a show a strike? No. Yeah, because yeah, they, they like to uh, 
they like this right. show because oh, yeah. music on or whatever. Like that would be just. I don't even. I don't, I, I don't know how that would work. No, no, it, w- it will but be all right. In, if they just do it for our, if they just do it for our show, then yeah. it would be probably no problem. There wouldn't be any copyright strike or anything. No, but. no, it won't be no copyright. It'll be original. Um, it'll be um, we'll probably get Second. a license. We'll probably get a license for it, and yeah, um, like a thirty-second intro. Well, no, no, it doesn't have to be a thirty-second intro. That's a full song, and it's not under any major record label. It's our song, like it's dedicated to us, right? It's dedicated to us. Someone has done a song on behalf of us. Right? No, I, no, I, I totally get it. It won't be copyrighted. I've already looked into it. Okay. Already, if someone copies and material, that's a different story. But yeah, that's something that you need to keep your hat on. But um, you can't, they, and, they, they can't uh, copy and use it because that would be uh, that would be copyright infringement. No, you can play you can play a promo um song. Uh, I mean, we can play the song at the start and um whatnot and. We can do a video clip. We can do a video clip with the song as well. So that will be. We'll talk about it later. We'll talk about it later. But um, but anyway, um, I want to get back. I really want to get back on radio. Um, here in Australia, it's a little bit harder. That makes you. I you got more um avenues. Uh, and I want to ask on radio. You guys got more avenues over there compared to Australia. There's so many more channels over there to choose from. Especially when it comes to satellite radio or um, just normal FM radio, you got more to choose from than what we've got here in Australia. Yeah, what's your big one? Is it like the triple something? I forget what it's called. What's your big rock station over there in Australia? Triple M. Okay, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah, and it's all kind of tied together. We do kind of, I guess, in the states. I never thought of it that way, but. Every city has a rock station for the most part, and we do have a lot of different options. But now there's like all over the world, you know, there's so many different options to listen to. Yeah, so you got to and, I, and can Spotify. Get, sorry, Daniel. Sorry, Daniel. I just want to ask this: Can we can we plug out the the radio station to the listeners? What is the radio station to tune into? Oh, so. Um, well, currently I'm on Riff in Detroit, so if you're in the Detroit area, it's WRAF. And they have a um, a web a, like a streaming device on the website that you can tune into. Yep, yep. You can go there and you can listen. Um, it's a rock station. It's really great rock music. So, and then I'm on weekends. Get us on that. Get us on that radio show. We we want an hour. We want an hour show every week. Just one one day, one hour, we play our songs on there. <laughs> oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, no. Actually, no. Make it two hours. Make it two <laughs> hours. <laughs> How about just like 16 hours? <laughs> like Tom. You know what I mean? Well, You've heard Bob and Tom, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. The syndicated show. Yeah. Yeah, Bob and Tom. They're out of uh, Minnesota. They're, they're awesome guys. I've been listening to those guys for like 20 years. Wow. They've been, yeah, they've been doing that show forever. I mean, that show is definitely, man, that show's kind of like one of a kind, you know? Oh, yeah. They're gold. Yeah, they're so, funny. And, so, and um, on radio, have you interviewed bands yourself or any artists yourself? Yeah. Um, I have for radio and then for the writing that I do. So it's always fun to do an interview like this where I'm being interviewed. It's so cool. It's so, you know, different and that sort of thing. So. (laughs) Uh, I haven't been starstruck while I'm interviewing, but when I actually meet them in person, I'm not starstruck. I'm just a little bit aware that do they recognize who I am because I interviewed them? Once I said, hey, Jamie from the Rocket Diaries, they interviewed, boom. Hey, man, how's it been? How's your show been going? Yeah, great. Wow. We have, we have a bit of a beer together. We have a chat. And that's why 
after, like, even before or after the show, I'm hanging out with them. I'm getting photos taken with them and whatnot. And, hey, it's no big deal. If you are just genuine and you're um, more civilised, you will get photos too. I remember when I bumped into Angus Young from ACDC here. Now, that was just a blessing in disguise. I did wow. not even plan it. I did not even plan it. My, my fiancé went to a pizza shop to buy me lunch. She got a pizza. Was walking about two metres behind her was Angus Young and his bodyguard. And she didn't recognise who he was. I did. But I was at the... I wasn't with my partner at the time. I, I was at a spot waiting for my partner to come back with my pizza. As soon as I saw my fiance, I saw this little short guy, which is Angus Junk, and his bodyguard right behind us. And I was just doing the sign singles. Like, we, we feed off each other. We give little sign singles. It was like, turn around, someone's behind you. She didn't know who he was. So I had to wait till she comes. I said, that's Angus Young from ACDC. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, yeah, I've got a photo with Angus Young and whatnot. And that wasn't planned. That wasn't planned. And I, yeah. That's so um, cool. That is such a cool story. It is. And you just sometimes you can walk into a jewelry shop. Like, we're still planning our wedding. We can be in a jewelry shop just trying out rings and whatnot and pricing. And standing right next to us will be someone from Iron Maiden, right? <laughs> Buying a black opal for his family and the rest of the band members. Black opal. Standing wow. right, right beside us in the jewelry shop. I was like, I'm going to that concert tomorrow night and he's buying jewelry right beside me. Forking out all these, all these um, black opal. He just buying them. It's like, oh man, I'm in the right place at the wrong time because he's buying something. I'm checking out rings for myself. He's from Iron Maiden. I love Iron Maiden, but do I get a photo inside a jewelry shop while they're doing business? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but you do, <laughs> you do get in those situations where you could be anywhere and sitting right across from you could be someone that you look up to, like a sport person or an author or someone in the music business. Hey, can you just imagine if you... <laughs> I know you're in Michigan, but can you just imagine if Governor Whitmer is in the same building? you probably want to go up and slap her in the face, wouldn't you? <laughs> I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Oh, I like Whitmer. I like her, but, but yeah, I mean, I can't imagine being in the same room as like Iron Maiden just randomly at the same grocery store or something like Bruce Dickinson right there. That yeah. would be crazy. <laughs> yeah, it, will be. it will be. Um, Damien, I mean, we've got to get some of this, um, this, um, music stuff, the merchandise from upon wing because fans out there that listen to their show, listen to our show. I want to say this. Yes, we get big names on our show. Yes, we get little bands. And the most important thing, we want you guys to support music in general. It might not be your cup of tea, but go out and listen to it. Go out and support it. Bands need as you much don't, support. You don't know what, don't know what yep. you're going to like until you listen to it, honestly. Like, exactly. I have such a wide variety of music that I listen to. I listen to, I listen to uh, rock and classical, and opera, and rap, and, like, all these different types of music, but every, everything that I listen to has a meaning behind it, like, I, I don't listen to mumble rap, I don't, I don't want to hear somebody mumble some, I, I don't understand what you're saying, but, but if you have a message to tell in your music, I want to hear that, and it, that, that's really what it comes down to, and even in, in music, there's there's a message in that music, that operatic music, that that uh, that I listen to, op Phantom of the Opera, and uh, just just all the opera that I listened to when I was younger, that, like all that stuff actually has a meaning, and you can feel it 
you don't even have to understand the language that they're speaking in. You just feel it for what it is. You understand, like, like uh, music well, is transcendent. It is. Well, more, mm-hmm. importantly, more importantly, can, can anyone imagine if Pavarotti was in a metal band? I could. I can definitely yeah. see. If Pavarotti was still alive, I can imagine him being in a metal band, right? A symphonic metal band. I mean, I, I had albums in my mother's place of Pavarotti. I used to listen to that when I was a kid. Right? Um, the three tenors, yeah, Pavarotti, Domenico, and somebody else, Pasisi, I think it is. The three tenors, I had that on vinyl. It's at mum's place. And, you know, what I want to say to the fans, in times right now, bands need your support. Just buy their merchandise. Go and buy the albums. Go and stream it on Spotify or even YouTube. Just give, it, give them some support. And more importantly, head over to our YouTube channel, The Rocket Diaries. You've got plenty, plenty of interviews there. There's a whole catalogue. And as a matter of fact, I'm going through some of the old um, interviews that for some reason, YouTube didn't put them up. They took them down. Uh, no, no fault of anyone. They just, for some reason, took them down. We're going to put them back up. We're going to put the the whole library back up on YouTube. Also, some of the old episodes on Podomatic, they will be coming over to YouTube too. So some of these interviews that many people haven't heard before will be on YouTube in the next couple of months. We're going through the catalog. And more importantly, Anne, I want to say this. You are welcome to be on our show anytime you shall please. You've got an open invitation. Thank you. I so appreciate that. I definitely will take you guys up on that. And I've had such right. a great time talking with you. So yeah. thank you. And I'll get you guys the new music when it's out, too. I'll send you guys copies and everything. Yeah. Well, stay with us, Anne. We're just going to wrap the show up. Stay with us. I want to give you a proper farewell to the other people out there. You know what you guys got to do. Like, share, and subscribe. And more importantly, I say this always, stay thirsty for metal. We'll catch you next time.